Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday, May 18th live session. Um, my name is Matthew, and I'm one of the course instructors. I'm going to hand the stream over to Professor Impey to welcome you, and then we will get started with your questions, which you can post in the chat, and we will get them from there. OK, thank you, and uh, welcome to everyone for another live session for the online classes or for whoever just happens to drop in. Um, ready to take your questions on astronomy. Excellent. The first question is from uh, the first question is from one of our live participants, who is Cheeky Bear, and they would like to know if two stars collided, would they go supernova or would they make a bigger star? Um. That's an interesting question, and it depends a little bit on how they collide. Um, if they collided at very high speed, it's actually possible that both stars would be disrupted because the gravitational sort of stretching or tidal force would probably rip the envelopes off both stars and actually might uh, you know, diminish them in terms of their luminosity or intensity. So there are various outcomes. That's one outcome, which is you get less afterwards because the material is dispersed into space to no longer become part of the fusion reactions. And the other alternative is they fully merge, which would imply a sort of slow speed collision, um, sort of sp spiraling in towards each other, basically. And then essentially you double the mass of the star. Um, and it's indeed possible that two stars that were below the threshold for forming a supernova would go above that threshold after a collision. And then you'd have a diff very different outcome for the one combined star than you had for the two individual stars. In general, though, this is an extremely low probability event because stars are very small compared to the space between them, even in a dense star cluster. And, and so stellar collisions really only happen in the center of places like globular clusters, so really quite unusual environments. Excellent, thank you very much. The next question is from an email. Ramnath would like to know um, more about the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. How can Ingenuity fly over Mars? Isn't Mars atmosphere practically non-existent? And um, are there limitations to the weight that can be supported? Uh, yes, it, it was a very challenging project. Um, so obviously they, they started with simulations, um, even before they built models at uh, JPL. They've been doing simulations for years once they knew that they could fit this on the, on the payload of the second rover. Remember, this is a really a twin of the original uh, Curiosity rover, but it's carrying a lot more weight, and the helicopter had to be fit into the package. So the simulation showed that the rotor speed compared to a similar sized drone on the Earth would have to be 10 times higher because the atmosphere is like 1% of the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere. And that large degree of rotation causes instabilities and vibrations. And so it was not clear they could make a, a machine that would work at that high level of rotation. And even so, the atmosphere is so thin that there are all sorts of instabilities. So it was definitely a challenge, even in simulations. And then the fact that you can't fully test it in the lab. So they used, uh, they suspended. Um, they partially offset the weight of the uh, helicopter once they had a model of it working in the lab, a full model. Um, they couldn't. They also worked with partial vacuum to try and truly simulate Mars conditions, but of course they couldn't do that and free fly over any distance. So at some level, when they got to Mars, they were relying on very minimal test flights in the lab and, and under not identical Mars conditions and simulations. So the fact that it worked is, is actually remarkable. And uh, it was designed as a experiment where it was not expected to succeed more than a few test flights. But it now seems that they're going to use the helicopter um, as a sort of pathfinder for the actual rover itself, since it can do reconnaissance and scout land ahead. And so it's actually going to very much help the mission and the efficiency of the rover. Um, so it was a very successful piece of aerodynamic engineering to make that helicopter work, and it's worked flawlessly so far. Um, and then what are the limitations of something like this? You know, how much load could a Mars helicopter ever be expected to 
um, carry? Could we build a full size one? Right. I think the Mars helicopter Ingenuity is is quite light. I think it's about four kilos, uh, maybe four pounds. I'm not quite sure of its weight, but it's um, it's very light and it cannot actually carry. It, it could not ferry rock samples around, for example. Um, so the thin atmosphere, you know, really limits the amount of lift you can get from a machine like this. So it's really only useful for for carrying cameras and for doing that kind of aerial reconnaissance. Now, of course, uh, NASA is planning a more ambitious equivalent of this technology, a sort of drone or helicopter technology for Titan, a um, uh, moon of Saturn. That's not a mission that's going to happen for less than 10 years from now, but the Ingenuity success is emboldening them to think that they really should be trying this technology on Titan. Titan has an atmosphere that it's at its base is actually thicker than the Earth's atmosphere. So on Titan, uh, flying the helicopter or the drone is not going to be a problem at all. Excellent. The next question is from Parth Sarda, who asks, how would the theory of supersymmetry impact astronomy and its future? What do you think about the supersymmetry of standard model particles? A supersymmetry is a foundational theory that uh, that seeks to account for the unification of all the forces of nature, the three forces of nature except for gravity, which is to say the, the weak and strong nuclear forces and the electromagnetic force. Um, and it hypothesizes out of that symmetry a sort of shadow set of particles that have uh, opposite quantum properties to the conventional particles. It also unifies fermions and bosons, which are the integer and half-spin particles. So it's a sort of uh, a grandiose umbrella around the standard model of particle physics that's trying to account for the artificial nature of the families of particles and their particular properties. Um, it applies to astrophysics in one obvious way that, of course, the Big Bang was once a place where this supersymmetry if it's a valid theory, would have been realized. And so in a sense, the universe evolved out of a supersymmetric situation very close to the time of the Big Bang. And so if the theory is correct, then it, it has implications for early universe physics and potentially for the type of observations we might do of the very, very early universe that could even affirm the theory itself. Excellent, thank you very much. The next question is from Isla Holroyd, who would like to know, uh, what is the difference between um, inflation and expansion of the universe, and why? So the regular expansion of the universe um, is the Hubble expansion. That's the usual way to describe it, because it was, um, it was observed first by Hubble in the late 1920s by the universal redshift of galaxies, so all galaxies appearing to move away from each other. That's the Hubble expansion. That's a uniform expansion. It's the same in all directions. and further away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us. So it's a uniform expansion, but it is changing over time, because as the universe um, has been smaller and denser, the rate of expansion has changed, and that means the Hubble expansion has changed its rate. But it's a pretty modest expansion at this point. It's measured in units. The Hubble constant is about 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec which means every megaparsec in distance you go away from the galaxy, three million light years, a galaxy is moving about 70 kilometers per second away from us. Inflation is a completely different beast in terms of expansion because it postulates an exponential expansion, so much more rapid than the linear or nearly linear expansion we see now that occurred in the first tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang. And the cause of that exponential expansion, the cause of inflation, is, is still controversial because uh, we've not identified the mechanism in fundamental physics that could give rise to inflation. The mechanism for Hubble expansion is simply the expansion of the universe that was put in place with the Big Bang itself. The next question is from Wendy Traver, who asks, can you talk about Jupiter's inward migration into the inner solar system? Yes, the theory of planet formation has had to be altered by our um, striking discovery of planet migration in exoplanets. So the discovery of hot Jupiters, um, the very first exoplanets discovered, 51 Peg and the handful after it, were all Jupiters on very tight orbits at a small at a small distance from the sun where it really couldn't have formed that way. There's just not enough material to make a massive planet 
a short distance from a sun-like star. So we had evidence from exoplanets that giant planets migrated. And that got people looking at our solar system and asking, were, well, were the planets always in the positions they had now? And the answer is probably not. It's difficult to be sure, of course, because if we're talking about uh, archaeology of the solar system or events that occurred billions of years ago where there's no current trace or proof of these events. So we use simulations and models to understand them. But there is indication that Jupiter has shifted its position significantly and in particular the outer planets Uranus and Neptune uh, substantially altered their positions early on in the history of the solar system. Um, Jupiter is the sort of gatekeeper of the solar system as by far the largest mass planet. It's the one most likely to cause the ejection of a planet, which may have also happened in our solar system very early on, or the rearrangement of the other planets. The next question is from Demetrius Siropoulos, who asks, why is a black hole's life expectancy proportional to its mass in contradiction to the star's life cycle? Right, that's a good question, and it's really because the physics is fundamentally different. Um, in the physics of stars and their lifetimes as fusion reactors, essentially, um, the mass of a star determines its lifetime. It's a very nonlinear relationship because more massive stars have hotter interior temperatures, and so they go through their nuclear fuel much, much faster than low mass stars. But there's a relationship there where more massive stars live shorter times. So the most massive main sequence stars, 50, 70, 80 times the mass of the sun, have lifetimes that are just a few million years. The sun has a lifetime on the main sequence of 10 billion years, and we're halfway through it. And the lowest mass red dwarfs have lifetimes of hundreds of billions of years, up to a trillion years. Black holes' lifetime from evaporation, the mechanism proposed by Stephen Hawking, is based on fundamentally different physics. It's actually based on quantum physics that applies at the event horizon that ra gradually seeps energy from the black hole, manifesting as a, a Hawking radiation or a temperature, and then equivalently by the black hole losing mass. And that process is nonlinear too because the, the lower mass the black hole, uh, the faster the evaporation time. So the most massive black holes live the longest amount of time. Uh, and the lowest mass black holes live the shortest amount of time. Again, it's, it's opposite to normal stars because the physics is quite different. Uh, let's see, the next question is from one of our live participants. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can rephrase it. Maybe you'll understand more what they're asking. But World of Science would like to know, what do you think of the recent discovery of, it says, of collisions of black holes of higher ratios, like one to 10 or more. It looks like there was some kind of research done um, mm -hmm. looking at maybe a blind spot, you know, of, of these high mass black hole collisions or something like that. Can you talk about what that is and the significance of it? Yeah, people are wondering about the statistics of the black hole collisions. These are, of course, the collisions that lead to the gravitational wave detections by LIGO. Uh, and Virgo and other gravity wave detectors. And there's now g several dozen of these known. And what's been seen is that they're mostly, for, first of all, the black hole masses are quite large. We don't see any black holes that are near the minimum mass of a black hole, which is about three and a half times the mass of the sun. The black, LIGO black holes are significantly larger, 10, 20, 30 times the mass of the sun. That's one surprise. And then the other surprise is the Unequal, unequal mass issue, where most of the mass ratios of the emerging black holes seen by LIGO are not a large factor. In other words, the, the more massive black hole is not a very large factor different from the small mass black hole. Uh, and that's a little surprising because you do expect to see more unequal mass ratios. Uh, and the reason why we haven't seen them is not clear because they should be detectable by LIGO. So this is actually sitting there as a sort of mystery in the LIGO data. The next question is from one of our online participants. Um, is Hawking radiation a theoretical concept or is it, has it been proven observationally? Hawking radiation is, is a purely theoretical uh, concept. It was predicted by Stephen Hawking in the late 1970s um, based on his application, as well as he could do it, of quantum theory to black holes. Now it's important to note that 
uh, black holes do not have a completely self-consistent description in quantum theory and so it's a kind of a kludge to apply quantum theory to black holes and as such people are not 100 percent sure that Hawking radiation is a robust prediction of, of physics theory that being said um, most people think the calculation is correct and nobody's found any fault with it in the decades since However, the mass of a black hole like the Sun, or a bit bigger than the Sun, would lead to a Hawking temperature of about a billionth of a Kelvin. That's a completely undetectable temperature in astrophysics. So unfortunately, Hawking radiation from normal black holes is, is simply not observable now, and it might never be, actually. Um, all right, the next question is from Mr. Name. If there were aliens in a galaxy a million light years away, would light make it unable to see them if they were younger than a million years? Well, if they were younger than a million years, um, we could still see them, we just have to wait. So um, if we saw evidence of aliens in a galaxy a million light years away, that information would be a million years old. Um, that means by the time we saw that information, there, another million years had passed and we wouldn't even know if the civilization still existed. And that's one of the big issues of <clears throat> thinking about alien civilizations, especially in other galaxies, that the light travel times are probably large compared to the duration of the civilization. And so it, there's no, it's not a matter of even having communication because that's so obviously far too long a time for communication. You're not even dealing with situations where the two civilizations are true contemporaries because they might not exist at the same time across space. Excellent. The next question is from Faisal who asks, is it possible for a dwarf star to turn into a gas planet? Well, the stellar planet boundary is a little diffuse. I mean, it's a little nebulous. To you know, use that word in a double meaning. Um, typically, the cool, too cool to be a star represents about 8%, just under 8% of the mass of the sun. And below that, you have a, a hot ball of gas, a sphere of gas that has its own internal heat. It will have a significantly high temperature, but its interior temperature will never get to the point of fusion, so it won't be a star, and it will slowly cool off. Um, that's not really a planet, that's just a, a hot dust and gas cloud that's cooling slowly. You don't know when you look at the surface of a star or dim star, red dwarf or brown dwarf, whether it's actually a rocky object at the center of it. In other words, is it a planet in the interior? We don't know how to measure that and we don't know how to look for that. So we make a distinction between stars and planets that way as well. Stars have their own light their own gravity. Uh, planets do not emit their own light and they definitely have rocky cores at the center of their gaseous envelopes. Um, uh, one of our participants would like to know uh, from an email, what is the current status of the Giant Magellan Telescope? Giant Magellan Telescope, we've cast the fifth mirror and uh, the other mirrors are polished. Their hardware is heading to Chile. The mountaintop has been scraped off. They're already starting to build and do construction. COVID has slowed things down, of course. It slowed all construction down on telescopes around the world. Chile was quite hard hit by COVID and is still not completely out of the woods. Um, but the project is going well. Um, there's enough funding, I think, it's about the 85% level to complete the project. It's a roughly a billion dollar project. So the partners that are on the books are good for about 850 million. Uh, but of course that money is spent over a period of time. It has to buy instruments as well as build the telescope. Best guess is on first light for the giant Magellan telescope or sort of like 2027. Uh, first light will be with four out of the seven mirrors with the remaining three uh, blank cells just because it'll take a while to finish all those seven mirrors. And you can do good science with, with four mirrors that are, are sort of balancing a central piece and three of the six petals. Um, so that's the best guess. Um, the money is there, the technical progress is good, and Giant Magellan Telescope should be on the air in about five years. Uh, the next question is from Art Studio, and um, we might have to work together to decipher the question a little bit, but 
It is how much do we require technology that doesn't use light to get information and depend on another source like gravitational waves for information about astronomy. So I guess it's basically how much astronomy is done with light and how much can be done with things other than light. Right. I mean, the traditional modes of astronomy are electromagnetic radiation. Um, so it would really broaden it from light to be any form of electromagnetic radiation. For centuries after the invention of the telescope, the only form of astronomy was optical astronomy, information carried by light. Uh, radio waves starting in the 1930s, radio telescopes with Jansky and Webb Reber, Grote Reber, um, gave us a new wavelength to look at, and then the other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum were developed, um, often involving satellites, because those waves don't reach the Earth's surface. So these are all messengers of light, broadly defined at all different wavelengths across the spectrum of the electromagnetic radiation, which is a factor of trillion in wavelength. Gravity waves are a, you know, a completely different type of messenger, because uh, they're a messenger of space-time space perturbations or space-time variations directly observed. Uh, and there's a limited number of phenomena that can be studied with those perturbations or space-time oscillations. Uh, but it's a completely different type of information than electromagnetic radiation because it's actually a way to see mass directly and the way mass changes in the universe. The next question is from Hernan Reyes who asks, um, if funding was not an issue, would it be possible to send humans on a trip to go around Jupiter and a few times um, and, and then come back? Uh, would it really be feasible to be able to protect the spaceship from radiation and meteorite hits and take along enough oxygen and water? I think an interplanetary trip of that scale would be uh, obviously very expensive and, and actually quite hazardous. And at the moment, NASA nor the other space agencies, they don't really think it's worth the expense and the, and the hazard because our robotic missions do so well. I mean, just look at Cassini. Uh, look at uh, the Huygens probe that landed on Titan some, and the missions that are planned now for Europa and also going back to Titan. We can do so much better with these robotic probes. Sending people there would be extremely difficult. It would be a long voyage because of the mass involved uh, to provide life support for the humans because they're not going to go into suspended animation. I mean, this, this is a journey of a few years, but it's not impossible for a human to just dure, endure it. Um, to avoid excessive amounts of mass on the spacecraft, you're making a trade-off of the energy required to send humans there with the level of shielding they would have from radiation and particle hits. That's a tough trade-off. Uh, going to Mars and back on the fastest route, fastest trajectory, you generate about a lifetime's worth of radiation exposure. Going to Jupiter or Saturn and back, Saturn even further, of course, you're generating uh, dozens or maybe a hundred lifetimes worth of radiation exposure. That means the, the odds of suffering from cancers or other very bad outcomes really become quite high uh, because you simply can't shield the spacecraft enough and make it a plausible cost. So for all these reasons, even though volunteers might be willing to do it, uh, I don't think NASA or any of the governments that do space uh, missions would accept sending people there in the foreseeable future. The next question is from one of our live participants. Some say that gravity is weak because it leaks into other dimensions. Uh, what do you think of this idea and is there any evidence for that? Yes, this is an idea of, um, you know, physics that's seeking to unify the various forces uh, that it's possible that um, gravity, the question that's being asked in the in this field is why is gravity so weak? Because of all the four fundamental forces, it's many orders of magnitude weaker than the next weakest force, which is the weak force within atomic nuclei that causes radioactivity. Uh, and so for that not to be some arbitrary consequence of physics, um, there are people who've wondered about mechanisms whereby the weakness of gravity is a reflection of the fact that it's distributed uh, fundamentally in a higher dimension and we're just seeing the manifestation of it in the three dimensions of space and one of time that we occupy. So this is an interesting theory and it has some effort behind it. There are dozens of papers that have been written about this idea. Verifying the theory, however, 
is going to require some very interesting experiments. Basically, you have to look for deviations from the inverse square law of gravity, which is the basic rule of gravity in the three dimensions we live in. There would have to be some very subtle but significant variations in that scaling on small scales, very small scales. Uh, and nobody's found that yet, but it's actually hard to do the experiment, so we don't know. So I think this, this idea is still out there as a possibility because it's very difficult to test experimentally. The next question is from Vasilis, who is on, uh, P. Vasilis, who's on with us live. Do you think there might be undiscovered physics, uh, we could make it general, undiscovered physics or any other kind of science inside living organisms? Um, I'm not sure we're going to learn about physics inside living organisms. We're definitely going to learn biology, and we may learn, for example, about neuroscience from living organisms because the, the way the brains and nervous systems of other creatures work is similar but also sometimes different from our own. So I think other organisms are teaching us more about uh, the physiology of, of our terrestrial biology and also about neuroscience in the case of uh, animals with brains. Um, it's not clear there's any physics going on that's something we wouldn't be able to measure in the lab. Animals or creatures, living creatures, are extremely messy laboratories or environments for studying physics. That's the real problem. To, to understand physics and tease out new physics, you really need a much more controlled environment than you get in a living creature. The next question is from Hedgehog Studios who asks, do you know anything about the Lyman Alpha Forest? And could you give me a basic overview of what it is? Yes, the Lyman Alpha Forest is, uh, Lyman Alpha is a resonant transition of a hydrogen atom at, at 1216 angstroms. Uh, and so it's, it's the ground floor transition. Uh, and so you see it typically in a cold gas. Um, and Lyman Alpha, is a used as a probe of the intergalactic medium uh, because when you look uh, at wavelengths blueward of uh, Lyman Alpha, you see a sharp cutoff because the universe is opaque. And at redward wavelengths, you see narrow absorption lines which indicate absorption by uh, clouds of intergalactic gas. And so you can use spectroscopy of quasars, you use the quasar as a flashlight far across the universe, and you look at the thicket of Lyman Alpha lines, which is actually called the Lyman Alpha forest in a spectrum, and each of those little absorption lines is mapping to a different region of intergalactic space where there's uh, an intergalactic hydrogen cloud. And you can measure the properties of these clouds and their evolution over time and their temperatures and densities and pressures if you make some assumptions. So it's a very powerful form of science. Uh, and basically, if you have a set of quasars, each making a different sight line through the universe, you can do 3D tomography, uh, threading a volume with different sight lines that are close together, and then looking along the redshift dimension to get the three-dimensional shape of this intergalactic medium. The next question is an email from Jan Campos, <coughs> who asks, considering the expansion rate of the universe, uh, how would our night sky appear to us if Earth existed seven billion years ago? Uh, would a backyard telescope be able to see more galaxies? Would large telescopes like Hubble give us better data and images? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, seven billion years ago, actually, the difference would not be that dr dramatic. At some point, it would get interesting and dramatic. But just seven billion years ago, the expansion rate of the universe <clears throat> has been changing relatively modestly because it was decelerating for much of that last seven billion years and then it was accelerating due to dark energy in the last three or four billion. So on average it's not changed in a highly nonlinear way. So if the universe say was um, redshift of one is something like seven billion years, that's doubling the size of the universe. So if the universe was half the size, the density would be eight times higher, distance between galaxies is half as much, but of course, you don't see galaxies with the naked eye. Seen through a telescope, though, the universe would look different. It would look more crowded because the galaxies um, were that much closer together and that much denser. Uh, the next question is from Ritik, who asks, uh, consider a hypothetical situation in which one end of a very long straw is in space 
a vacuum and the other is in an ocean or a sea, would all of the water be sucked through the straw f into the vacuum of space? Hmm. Interesting question. It depends, on, of course, on the width of the straw a lot. Um, but, but generally, the answer is no, because at some point, as the water is pulled by surface tension um, up the straw column, then the column, the weight of the column of water, reference to the Earth, would exceed that uh, tension and upward force that's exerted due to the straw. So, uh, no, gravity in the end would, would stop you from pulling the Earth's oceans up through a straw, no matter how long the straw was. The next question is from Andrew Johnson, who asks, does space-time have the elastic property of resistance to compression? Uh, so would a gravitational well for a given mass be deeper in the early universe prior to expansion? Um, the gravitational well of a particular mass is still just keyed to that mass. So, um, you know, the depth of the well and the mass and the distortion of space-time is not changing with the mass. What's different in the earlier universe is that the space-time itself is, is compressed. But that doesn't affect the distortion of the space-time and general relativity caused by the mass. It just means that the scale of that distortion is shrunk with the shrinking of the universe earlier. MKR asks, how did Earth or any other planetary body get gravity? Uh, where does the gravity come from? And the gravity just comes from the stuff. So universal force of gravity means that everything has gravity, everything, down to a subatomic particle. Electrons have gravity, but in most physics situations, the electron's behavior is dictated by its electric charge, and its gravity is negligible in, in how it behaves. So objects like the Earth or a star or any object uh, has the sum of the, all the gravity of the individual particles of which it's made, and then the mass dictates the gravity. And that's true however big or small the object is. It's just that on some very small scales, other forces uh, become more important than gravity. The next question is from one of our online participants. Carl Heinz Becker asks, how may the results of DESI, D-E-S-I, help understand dark energy? So the DESI survey is uh, being done by the National Observatory. It's a big, big consortium. Uh, hundreds of scientists are involved. And it's doing uh, deep and wide field sky surveys of galaxies, faint galaxies. And it's looking at dark energy in a couple of different ways. Um, it's looking in particular at weak lensing. So lensing of galaxies is the distortion of galaxy light caused by dark matter along the way. And the way dark matter and dark energy play through the age of the universe affects the way they distort light. And so knowing about dark matter and trying to look for dark energy means you can look at the way the gravitational distortions have changed over cosmic time to diagnose something about dark energy. Another way it's used is by looking at the incidence of massive clusters throughout the age of the universe. So clusters of galaxies form, the massive objects like clusters of galaxies form quite late, and the rate at which clusters form in the universe over time is definitely a function of dark energy, because dark energy uh, is essentially making things get more diffuse and move further apart, so it, it slows down the rate of cluster formation. And so seeing how clusters have formed through the history of the universe is a very direct indication of the strength of dark energy over that time. So those are two, there are a couple of other slightly more esoteric and technical ways that that survey can diagnose dark, mat uh, dark energy. But it's an exciting survey and it's taken a good fraction of its data at this point. The next question is from Arnold Ginsberg, who's on with us live. Is there a theoretical distance that gravitational waves travel so that they would become too weak to detect? Um, it depends, of course, on the sensitivity of your, of your detector. I mean, we've got gravitational wave detectors that give us an enormous reach, uh, even though it's a fairly new technology. LIGO and its counterparts in Europe, Virgo and the Japanese, have a system now, too. They're detecting gravity waves from black hole mergers at distances of several billion light years, which is an incredible reach. The strength of a gravity wave signal uh, goes down linearly with distance in the universe. 
Now recognize that's a slower decline of strength than from radiation. Radiation, because intensity is the square of amplitude. The amplitude of an electromagnetic wave goes down with distance linearly, but the intensity goes down as the square because it's amplitude squared. So the strength of electromagnetic radiation falls off much more quickly than does gravity waves, which mean which is part of why even our modest first generation gravity wave detectors are able to see the mergers of very small objects, just stellar black holes at distances of billions of light years. It's quite an impressive achievement. Uh, the next question is from JJR Live. How does the weak nuclear force help in reactions that allow the stars to shine? Um, the weak nuclear force is responsible, among other things, for radioactivity. Um, and so the weak nuclear force is a force that operates in the atomic nucleus. And the rate of fusion, which is when you have high energy particles with positive charges like protons, and you're forcing them to merge or coalesce or fuse, um, a countervailing force is the weak force, which of course is causing nuclei of atoms to disintegrate, so it's going in the opposite direction. So you have to actually feed in the strength of the weak force and your understanding of it to get anything like the right rate of fusion calculations in stars. And so that those calculations could not be done until we had a good measurement of what the weak force strength was in atomic nuclei. The next question is from Arkham Nias, who asks, can you please, uh, this is from an email, can you please explain the process of an eclipse and how it can happen um, on sort of close dates. You know, they happen, um, you know, very, you know, sometimes happen close to each other. And um, I guess, well, maybe that's not the, what they mean. What they mean is, can we see lunar eclipses in the full, like in, during the day? And why, so can we see a, a lunar eclipse during the day and uh, if not, why? Well, if you think of the geometry, there's sort of two questions here, so I'll answer the second one first. When you can see a lunar eclipse, basically. If you think of the geometry of a lunar eclipse, a lunar eclipse is caused by um, the moon passing through the Earth's shadow. And that means, by definition, that the moon and the sun are in opposite directions from the Earth, 180 degrees apart from each other. So that right away tells you that uh, if you're seeing the moon in above you in your sky, it must be nighttime on that side of the Earth. And so therefore, you, you can only really see lunar eclipses at night. It, it's at the extremes, you can see them near dusk or dawn, but mostly they're seen at night because of that 180 degree apart situation of the sun and the moon relative to the Earth. For the other question of where eclipses occur in pairs or there's patterns to the eclipses, that's understood in terms of the line of nodes. Um, part of the reason that eclipses don't happen every month is that the Earth-Sun and Earth-Moon distances are varying, and more fundamentally, the plane of the Moon's orbit of the Earth is four degrees tilted from the Earth's orbit of the Sun. If these two things were not true, if the Earth-Sun and Earth-Moon distances never changed and there was no tilt of the Earth's Earth-Moon axis to the Earth-Sun axis, you would have a lunar eclipse every month and a solar eclipse every month. But we don't because of this tilt. But what happens is, given that tilt, if you imagine two planes inclined, there's a line of nodes, as it's called, which is the intersection of those two planes. And that means there are paired situations where you can tend to have eclipses. And that's why eclipses do have patterns in their recurrence because of the tilt of the orbits. Green P, who's on with us live, um, asks, recent statements from defense officials and senators seem to show some concern over military UFO sightings. Obviously, these are not ETs, but do you see any implications uh, for this in the field of astronomy? Yes, this whole uh, UAP phenomenon is getting quite interesting. UAP is unidentified aerial phenomena, phenomena and it's essentially a recasting by the military uh, of what has traditionally been called a UFO. And I think they've done it for the obvious reason that the UFO term has been stigmatized by the fact that there's, there's so many sightings that are just nothing to do with 
alien visitations. So they just wanted to, to sort of hit a reboot on the naming of the phenomenon so that people might be able to study it more dispassionately. So as we've all seen in the last few years, the military have started to release, especially from the Navy, uh, videos of Navy pilots uh, who have seen phenomena that they can't explain. Uh, these are pretty reliable reports as opposed to the standard UFO report because pilots are trained to be uh, careful observers. They, they're they aware of data and they always note position, time, date, and location, speed, everything they can measure. So there's quite a lot of information attached to these reports. Often they're corroborated because pilots fly in tandem or there's two people in a plane, so it's not usually an individual sighting. And they also are aware of what military technology can do with an important caveat. Uh, the important caveat is that the, the most the, the least unconventional explanation for UAPs, in other words, not that they're alien visiting us, is that they are extremely high-tech uh, secret technologies that are under development by the United States or other state actors uh, with rather unusual capabilities that, that make them sometimes appear unphysical. There are reports of rapid direction changes of speeds that appear to be highly supersonic in very short periods of time and so on. Um, so what's not clear yet is whether we can rule out experimental military craft by our government, by the United States government, or by other governments. Um, the Navy is due to release a report to Congress next month, and there's going to be a lot more information there. But these videos have been released, and at least in this case we know these videos are not faked, and they're not people trying to get attention or publicity or make money, because uh, the military and the people involved have no motivation to do that. So they're among the more credible sightings of what we used to call UFOs that I've seen. Uh, the next question is from Mr. Name, who would like to know, what are the upper limits in terms of size for telescopes? It's an interesting question, because the engineering of telescopes is potentially reaching a maximum. There's a generation of telescopes that are planned for the late 2020s in the next uh, seven or eight years, which are in the range of 25 to 40 meters. So there's the 24 and a half meter Giant Magellan Telescope, the 30 meter um, uh, gi Giant Californian Telescope, and the 39 meter Extremely Large Telescope of the Europeans. Um, to go beyond that, people have done engineering studies. I'm aware of several engineering studies that have tried to do football field size telescopes, so 100 meters. Um, and at that point, it starts to become difficult to construct a telescope that's steerable or movable because the mechanical stresses, the wind buffeting, the thermal inertia and the thermal coupling to the atmosphere and the difficulty of equalizing the temperature, those are problems that all apply to big telescopes and they just become worse the bigger the telescope is. And they go worse as the area rather than the size. So for a twice as big telescope as a 40 meter, they're four times worse. That doesn't mean you couldn't build a 100 meter telescope, but it would be extraordinarily expensive and it just might not very well perform as well as the biggest telescopes below it. I think what's more smart use of your money if you want to build big is to turn your, put big telescopes together in interferometry mode, which gives them much better angular resolution and then you don't have a single giant telescope, you mock up a giant telescope by using the elements as an interferometer. Excellent. The next question is from um, one of our live participants. Um, how would an artificial sun, which carries on fusion, affect the astronomic astronomical world? So like a few, you know, which carries on fusion. So I'm not sure if they mean in space or if they mean fusion on Earth. Um, I'm assuming they mean some kind of fusion reactor on Earth, but uh, mm -hmm. would that affect uh, astro astronomy? Well, of course, there is a goal still, <clears throat> a long-term goal of energy policy to create a sustainable fusion reactor. <clears throat> At the moment, fusion reactors uh, cannot really achieve the break-even where they get more energy out than you put in. And if they do, they do so for a fraction of a second. So we're very far from a sustainable fusion reaction. But just let's imagine the research gets better, 
there's enough investment and so a sustainable fusion reactor is developed. Well, it would be an extremely miniature star. It would indeed be operating like a star, uh, but it would be a highly miniaturized star. And of course, the extremely high temperature of the fusion reactor would be contained magnetically and then within multiple layers of a building. So it's not like you're going to be blinded by the light of this object. So a fusion reactor, should it exist, will be nothing that would affect astronomy or anything else. It will be an incredible engineering achievement since we're really so far from doing it. The next question is from Arnold, who's on with us live. How close to the speed of light could a human body travel without being crushed or destroyed? Well, in principle, if you could do it, if the energy costs were possible, um, it wouldn't affect you at all. I mean, special relativity provides for the speed of light as an absolute limit, and it says that as you approach the speed of light, as seen by another observer, you suffer distortions of your time, your space, and your mass. Um, now, none of those effects intrinsically mean that you couldn't survive it. it. Being more heavy, okay, at some point that would be not survivable. Being squashed, unless it was extreme, it would be survivable. And having your time dilate, you might not even notice. So I would say that the relativistic effects, the extreme effects of relativity, where those distortions become of the order of a factor of two or more, which point they really might affect the ability to survive it, uh, those happen within a percent of the speed of light. So you could get to uh, well above 90% of the speed of light and not have any uh, dramatic problems, I think, surviving it. The energy cost, of course, would be prohibitive. The next question is from uh, one of our live participants. NASA made a simulation about an asteroid that would impact the Earth. How do they calculate the place and the speed of impact of, uh, during these simulations? They have to use a range of parameters. So mm, we know where near-Earth asteroids come from. They obviously come primarily from the asteroid belt. They're scattered inward towards the Earth's orbit from the asteroid belt. And we know typically what their velocity, their inward velocity, is likely to be as they leave. It will be accelerated somewhat as they get closer to the sun. So the velocity, the net velocity towards us of an object um, is pretty clear. If it's on a direct radial inward path and we have a transverse motion, you can calculate that velocity too. Um, so that's part of the simulation. And then, of course, the other thing it completely depends on the mass because the kinetic energy that goes as the mass and the velocity squared and so you, you need to know the size of the object. Um, so near-Earth asteroids simulate a range of impact velocities and a range of masses um, and maybe even a range of angles because some of these impactors could come from well above the ecliptic or below the ecliptic and so come from slightly different directions. So these simulations take into account all these variables. The next question is from Kishore Tiwari, um, who would like to know what would happen if two children, two newborns, say twins, um, were born um, and one was on Earth and one was on Mars. When the baby on Earth is 10 years old, how old would that be on Mars? Well, I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, you're alluding to the fact that the Mars day is uh, somewhat longer, five or six percent longer than the Earth Day. Um, so I guess the question is, would the body clock of someone born on Mars uh, alter their rate of growth and progress? The, so the two big differences on Mars, assuming an artificial habitat, are that that natural day being longer, and you can mitigate that with artificial light, and the gravity being lower, 40 percent of terrestrial gra gravity. I think in terms of the development of a baby starting from birth, the gravity will be a much stronger effect and that would lead to real divergence between the property of the identical twin on the Earth and, and Mars. Uh, the effect of a slightly longer day, assuming they were sensitive to the day and they weren't in an artificial light environment, it's not clear what difference that would make because humans do have circadian rhythms built in. We have them built in biologically. Um, and those natural rhythms are slightly longer. Uh, 
than the diurnal rhythm that we're subject to on the Earth, but not that much longer. But that's a, that's a smaller effect in percentage terms. The next question is from Sharong Meng, who would like to know, since the universe is expanding in all directions, like a balloon, and stars and galaxies are supposed to move away from us, why is Andromeda, or the Andromeda galaxy, moving towards us? Right, so the Hubble expansion is reflects the global expansion of space-time, space-time expanding uniformly in all directions. And you just need to think of the galaxies as sort of markers of space-time. But they're not markers of space-time uh, completely tied to the space-time. They're markers of space-time that exert gravity on each other. And so when galaxies are in proximity, uh, then the gravity between them can exempt the galaxies from that underlying expansion of space-time. And that's exactly what happens with the Milky Way and Andromeda. It also is what happens in a cluster of galaxies, where the cluster of galaxies are all on uh, giant elliptical looping orbits in a large volume of space, but the cluster itself is not expanding if it's a bound system, even though space-time underneath it and around it is expanding. So Andromeda and the Milky Way are massive enough galaxies, and they got close enough together that they are marginally bound, as physicists would say. That's, they're not strongly bound, but they are heading towards each other at 100 kilometers per second. And that's not going to change. And the expansion of the universe is not going to change that either. That net velocity will sustain until at 3.5 billion years from now, they swoop around each other and coalesce or collide. The next question is from uh, Axe of Ulster, who would like to know, in regards to the future of space travel, do you know of any research that is going on with regards to artificial gravity, or what potential is there um, for creating something like artificial gravity? Yeah, there are various uh, designs for space stations, you know, and sort of second or third generation from the International Space Station. Uh, where you can, for example, uh, you can put, uh, have a space station, it doesn't have to be an enormous uh, sort of wheel-shaped thing in, in orbit or spinning to generate artificial gravity. You can have uh, two pods at either end of a spindle and just spin up the spindle and generate artificial gravity. So there are several quite mature engineering designs for space stations that would spin, essentially, to create artificial gravity in, in even quite modest-sized environments. Uh, and I think people think that for some long-term habitation in space, obviously astronauts have been in the space station uh, for more than a year, some number of them, probably a dozen of them, have done multi-year stays. But if people are going to, in much larger numbers, live in orbit or off Earth, then probably they will need the artificial gravity of these designs. But these designs exist, and the cost of them is no more than the normal space stations that we've already built. The next question is from Wendy, um, who sent an email. Is it thought that other solar systems might have an asteroid belt and or an Oort cloud, um, like where Earth gets its organic molecules and water? Uh, it seems unlikely if these structures would reside only in our solar system. Yeah, it's an uh, interesting question as to how much of the, of the detail, if you like, of our solar system is replicated in other star systems. Obviously, we're not going to expect to find an exact twin of our solar system down to the detail. We do expect to find other solar systems that have a set of terrestrial planets and a set of giant planets. The asteroid belt is a, what would normally be the position of a planet, and it appears to be a failed planet because you sweep it all up and it's about 4% four four of the mass of the Earth, so really quite modest. So most of that material scattered out of that, uh, that radius of orbit uh, a long time ago. And that's a reasonable thing to happen in a solar system. So I would imagine failed planets in solar systems that amount to their version of an asteroid belt, not at the same distance of ours, of course, is not an uncommon thing. Oort cloud also is maybe not uncommon because dynamically it was caused by early on in the dynamics of the solar system uh, scattering of a some set of objects into essentially kicking them out by the migration of the planets and all the unstable dynamics of the early part of our history of solar system scattering out this large set of chunks of rock and ice perhaps a trillion of them into the Oort cloud stretching 50 to 100,000 AU from the Earth. 
And that mechanism is also common to dynamical rearrangement of planets which can kick out the small rocks from the system into a spherical cloud. So yes, I, I do actually expect that something like an Oort cloud and something like an asteroid belt might exist in not all, but many other solar systems. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, I think we, so it's 1.57, I think we have time for one more question, um, and then we will wrap up for today. SHPS Energy asks, how do black holes release jets of matter from their center and send it to distance, distant places, piercing everything that comes in between? So the, the key is that the black holes don't send the mass from their center, because their center would be a singularity, and they don't even send it from within the event horizon. So the event horizon marks off the d region of a black hole that's, that's sequestered from the rest of the universe, sealed off, cannot communicate with us, and nothing can escape. So the jets that black holes make, which we have observed from medium and very large black holes in particular, must be created outside the event horizon. And we know mechanisms that can cause this. Black holes are spinning because of the way they form from the stars that were spinning or gas clouds that were spinning. And as they spin, they're going to attract a accreting disk of gas. That's an accretion disk. That's a common phenomena around stars of all kinds, not just black holes. And in the dynamics of the accretion disk, it's possible for the plasma to be fed in towards a black hole. And because there's lower pressure along the poles of the spin of the black hole, that plasma will escape and will actually be accelerated along the poles. So you have a particle accelerator, plasma accelerator operating that's essentially driven by the spin energy of the black hole and its gravity indirectly. And so black holes do actually form a natural mechanism for particle acceleration and for making plasma jets go out at large fractions of the speed of light, at which point they could escape a galaxy, go into the intergalactic medium, and so on. So it's a, it's a fascinating type of high-energy astrophysics that happens in the vicinity of the event horizon of a black hole, but not within it. It all happens within about 10 to 50 Schwarzschild radii of the black hole. That was a good question to end with, and appreciate the variety and the good questions this week, as always. Um, we'll be back. I don't think we have our next one scheduled, but we'll be announcing them soon. Thanks to Matthew for facilitating, and we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. And we do have our next one scheduled for two weeks from today. Okay. It will be Wednesday, um, uh, two weeks from this week. So we will see you all then, and we hope you have a great weekend, or a great week and weekend. Take care, everyone.